it's great to be here tonight and thank you everyone that's come along and you know can I start by saying how fantastic Michelle was um, really challenging really insightful and you know made me feel totally inadequate I mean did you, did you just notice as well you know doctor um, senior business executive and by the way I was also a gymnast you know just just <laughs> threw that in there um, so but thank you uh, Michelle and I really look forward to sharing with you in a little while. Um, and it's also great to be with a predominantly group of 25 to 35 years old. Um, when Justine alluded to a couple of events, maybe not my best demographic um, in uh, issues that I won't go into. But look, um, my chief of staff is here, and it was his fault, right? So <laughs> just, just by and by. Um, <laughs> So look, I, I um, reflected, funnily enough, uh, I thought, okay, leadership, perspectives, um, it's been a journey. You know, what are four things um, that I've kind of thought of as I go back and reflect? Now, I haven't done a lot of time reflecting, but there's really kind of four things that I think um, kind of make a real difference in terms of leadership. And obviously many here are at the start or uh, have had lots of experience, but you know, hopefully there's some resonance uh, across the four. You know, so look, uh, and a lot of my time uh, with good leaders, there was one thing that really stood out, and that was this sense of vision. You know, they, they knew, he or she knew where we were going and what we were doing. And they had a capacity to kind of connect you into that story. Like, I can see where we're going, and I've got a role in that, and let's go. And there's an energy that comes when it's very clear, as opposed to just treading water. You know, many leaders sort of get there, and they just sort of hold the fort, um, keep managing, and there's no sense of vision about what they're doing. And there's real energy that comes with that. In the context of a political environment, there's all types of examples uh, that you can use. But you know, the one I reflect on was the decision um, in terms of leasing poles and wires. Relatively boring concept, um, standalone. But the energy that came with that was, well, if this is done, you know, where do we go? Um, as a state and an organisation, what is it that we can actually build and make a difference to people's lives, including schools and hospitals and roads and public transport, a whole range of infrastructure that for so long had been promised and, and not delivered. And that was energising. Um, the thing about the formation of that, though, was the decision um, was a very different one in a cabinet context, because the decision was not the usual. We've got an election coming up in 10 months. Uh, we better actually sort of focus on how to win the election. Uh, the discussion was different. It was a context, okay, put that aside, election. If we're given the privilege and opportunity to continue to govern, uh, what do we need to do? You know, what does the state need to drive the economy, to deliver better services, to improve people's lives, and how do we get there? And following that discussion, um, everything kind of fell into place. There was a clear vision a clear understanding, and yes, there were political challenges that came, but what we're all in for and fighting for uh, was actually a better state in the long term in terms of a generation and the quality of people's lives. You know, I had a strong sense that people didn't go home at night and hug a telegraph pole and say, thank goodness. <laughs> you know, we've still got 100% ownership of this. Uh, <laughs> well, I kind of thought, well, there might be a bit difference that, you know, if you have a sick child, and you go to the hospital and your hospital's 50 years old, you know, you actually want the best possible facilities to support our teachers and, um, oh, sorry, not teachers, that's schools. Uh, <laughs> our doctors and nurses, you know, we need to support them and what they did on a daily basis. So, you know, that sense, you know, one example of a vision that kind of drives an energy and a, and a platform, and there'll be many other examples we could talk about. I think the second um, idea that comes to me is something that's underrated and it's unity. And I think every leader has a great responsibility uh, to spend more time on this uh, than they generally do. There's great power in teams coming together. I had an offsite with my team actually the last couple of uh, days and I think what I have is a team of champions as opposed to a champion team. Lots of people with great capacity and passion and they're operating their way uh, but not necessarily as one. And a team that actually comes together uh, in terms of full potential is so much more significant uh, than individuals operating uh, within their own silos. 
And leadership also starts to fragment when that unity becomes destructive. So individuals against others, not agreeing with overall directions, personalities starting to take over. That concept of unity is something that's very precious. And I think it goes much broader, and it manifests much broader. I reflect on you know, one uh, December, which will be very familiar uh, to you, when I got a, a call just before a press conference, and the decision, uh, well, the, the issue was, you know, Premier, uh, we have a hostage, it's hostages have been taken uh, in the Lint Cafe. Um, we're going to have to take you to uh, basically emergency command, um, you know, straight after this press conference. That was a pretty uh, tense press conference, wondering what that meant and how that was going to play out. Um, but without going through all the events of that day and night, um, you know, I can tell you that when the moment came that the siege came to an end and we lost two lives, uh, I can't begin to describe uh, how I felt. You know, that sense of uh, despair, uh, that sense of sorrow, uh, and in some sense, anger. You know, how did this happen? You know, wasn't there anything else we could do um, to save Tory and Katrina? And as I reflected on the next few hours, I realised that there was great potential uh, for city, state and country to be incredibly angry. And the reaction uh, was something that was anything, potentially uh, anything but unity. And I was very fearful. And as I was there with the police commissioner, there was a sense we have to come together and we have to keep the city and the state and the country together in that moment. And as we revolve forward over the few days, I think um, in some of the most difficult times, some of the most amazing moments of my life, because the city did come together. You know, rather than hate and anger, there was love, there was peace and there was certainly unity. And the power of that unity, you know, we were standing together with the victims. We were standing for what we believe in, the values and uh, the freedoms that, you know, our diggers have fought so hard for. And we stood as one. Indeed, I had a young Muslim man uh, who came down to put flowers with um, some of his friends. And he said he'd never felt more part of this city and country than he did at that moment. So the power of unity cannot be underestimated. Um, there will be times of conflict, don't get me wrong, but unity is so powerful and so pervasive and so significant, I think, uh, to successful leadership. The third point is, uh, I think there is, uh, for all leaders and those that don't even consider some, themselves leaders, uh, you are actually a leader, everyone's a, everyone's a leader in some form, there are moments that matter. And you will know them uh, when you're confronted with them. There'll be something within you that says, I have to respond. I have to act. You know, whether it be a sense of injustice or a sense of total inefficiency um, or a sense of um, something that makes no sense whatsoever. This is, this is a problem or challenge that I've got to respond to. And I think the, the good leaders, the great leaders, um, you see it. It doesn't happen all the time, but there are moments that matter and you see them stand up. They stand up for what they believe in and what needs to be done. Uh, as I reflect back, just one example that, that I think of was, um, you will remember when we had the, the refugee crisis flowing uh, out of Syria and uh, many other countries around, um, probably the largest humanitarian crisis that, that we have faced. And we saw those images. I remember the images that came. And I remember being horrified uh, by them. And you know, I remember that young boy uh, that was there. We saw him, a tragic representation of the crisis unfolding before us, a young three-year-old boy you know, lying there uh, on a beach. And I was um, moved in the context, I can't just sit here. You know, I have a position of some responsibility as the Premier of the state to speak. And not necessarily in my jurisdiction, but an ability or a chance to 
influence. If I didn't say something in the years to come, would I look back and say, I should have stood up at that moment? And there's little tots of pressures at times. Um, Tony Abbott, who was Prime Minister, is a very good friend of mine. Um, if I spoke up on that issue, it was going to make his life difficult, complicated. And uh, I obviously had to weigh that up. Um, but I did speak and respond. And you know, there was a national debate that ensued. And I believe that we're richer as a country uh, because you know, we did actually participate and play a role in one of the great humanitarian crises uh, that we faced. And our country stood up and said, we will take some more refugees to make a contribution. Um, that was an incredibly proud moment. And you know, I should just put an anecdote in. And Tony Abbott, who gets a lot of uh, bad press, um, and he should for his budgies, um, to be honest. <laughs> That's something he should get a lot for. But um, look, you know, in this moment, and it was a, uh, you know, a private moment, I, I told him that I was going to um, say something quite strong on this issue. And it went into the papers and uh, the media in quite a significant way. And he came back to me the next day and he said, Mike, it's OK. You know, I understand. You're standing up for what you believe in. And I really appreciate letting me know. Um, but please, don't feel bad for standing up for what you believe in. I thought it was a remarkable thing from a prime minister that's often not reported. So that's just an anecdote as well. Um, grace and humility in leader. Uh, is incredibly important as well, as Michelle spoke about. Um, so the last point, um, which is connected, and interesting enough, uh, Michelle connected on this as well. You know, a leader's got to have values. You know, you, you, you must stand for something. And you know, some here are Christians, some here aren't Christians. Um, you know, those that don't, there'll be values you aspire to and hold to. Uh, an organisation, I mean, they're, they're beautiful things, cor corporate value statements. Um, so many wonderful words. So, <laughs> so many good things going on. Um, yeah, the question is, are they actually living them? More importantly, are their leaders living them day in, day out? And I think there's great power if they do. Callum Ward, he's the, the, the captain of the GWS Giants. You know, they have on their... Um, dressing room, the massive, it's this huge poster, one word, selfless. And he said that that drives him every day. You know, he's got a role and responsibility and he's going to do it and he's not going to let his teammates down. If, he, if there's a tackle he made, he's going to make it. And he said even when he's in the gym, and, he, and they do lots of sessions in the gym, he said he does not cut short any of his reps that he's assigned. He tries and does another one because he feels that he's letting someone else down. That sense of pervading selflessness to his task. Um, you know, from my point of view as a, as a Christian, you know, I had a strong sense uh, of my faith uh, day to day. I am incredibly appreciative that I stand here knowing um, because Christ died for me, I am going to heaven. And in that context, uh, I am doing everything I can uh, to live in accordance uh, with that faith. And if you follow through what happens in the context of the Christian faith, uh, which I fail on a regular basis, but it is the desire and drive, that sense of faith, and uh, sorry, kindness, gentleness, um, self-control, patience, uh, grace, uh, there is great uh, value uh, that comes through the, the Christian faith. And there's, I finish on this, there's a quick picture. My, my sense of power um, in the Christian faith is, is a lot in this. This is a picture by Rembrandt of the prodigal son. Some might have heard of the, um, that, pro that um, parable. But it's a father whose son uh, grew up and headstrong. Um, he resisted the father and to the, to the point he didn't want to work on his father's farm. There's a property that they all worked on. Uh, and he eventually said to him, look, I want a, my inheritance, I want to go live my own life. And in the custom of those days, anyone that did that, uh, it was pretty simple. You were basically telling your father you wanted him dead. You couldn't put a worse dishonour upon him. Uh, this son went away for a few years. He spent all of his inheritance. Uh, he ended up in a position where he had nothing. Um, he was eating uh, the scraps with, with pigs, is the story. 
um, but no food, no place to stay, nothing. And he said, you know what, I'm better to try and go back to my father and be a slave with him because I'll at least have a bed and be looked after. Now, when he turns back to his father's house, uh, there is this sense. The father sees him. And what does he do when his son returns? Well, he runs to him. He embraces him, as you can see behind. And he unconditionally loves him. That sense of unconditional grace, which is at the core of what the Christian gospel is, uh, pervaded that sense uh, of that father living it out. And I think of the world and any leadership, someone that enacts and lives as the father in this picture is someone I think is going to resonate in a deep way uh, with their team. I think the team is stronger and I think the country is stronger uh, the more we have of this sort of love and this sort of grace uh, in the community. So whatever values you aspire to, um, my strong sense is live them, uh, don't talk about them, and you can make a real difference to your team, and I believe the same in the country. Thanks very much.